This is Hook Court in Dorset, and we reckon that most of what you can see here dates to the English Civil War in the mid-1600s. But there are clues that there was once something much older and grander here. Take a look at this. You see this huge moat? That is in the back garden. Now, as far as I know, a moat means a castle or a grand medieval house. So on this island, there could be something here from the Middle Ages, maybe even from the time of William the Conqueror himself. These days, Hook Court is used as a school, and the teachers would love to be able to tell the kids more about its history. But you don't know very much about it, do you, Mandy? No, not very much at all. And we'd love you to find out more. So who is it that Mandy's called in? Time Team! And how long have we got to find out anything? Three days! Do you think we'll find anything under the grass, JJ? Yes. What sort of stuff? Brick walls and doors. Yeah, we always find brick walls, but not doors so often, do we? Well, there are a whole array of standard features in a medieval house. We've got, for example, the gatehouse there, and that leads you through to a great hall. But, you know, the gatehouse might have been on another side. The hall could have been elsewhere. So clearly this accommodation block wasn't destroyed by fire during the Civil War, but it's the only bit that still survives. Our job is to look for the rest of the manor house, which should be in this area defined by the moat. Sounds quite easy, doesn't it? The trouble is, there could be 500 years of different buildings buried under this lawn because the Doomsday Book records that there was a manor here way back in the 11th century. The legend is that there was a fire here in the Civil War and clearly the kids are hoping we can find out more about it. Others, though, are just as excited to see so much surviving in the ground. Oh, that there's so many. On a right oh, angle. So many walls. And it's only a matter of seconds before Phil turns up the first find. Yeah, maybe 16, 17. There's the roof. <laughs> nice nail <laughs> hole in there, look. And you're getting this, which is oh, wow. 16, 17. Bit of bone as well. 16, 17. Something like that, yeah. That'd be a good, good, good candidate for when it's, you know, being heavily destroyed. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah. no later stuff either. So oh, could, well, that's good. It that's could good. Be, it, it's, Let's it's carry on, Ian, please. Well. This is our house burning in the English Civil War, but this isn't Victor's work. This is Bridget, age seven, and this one is Tom, age six. Do we have very many more details other than the fact that it just went up in loads of flames? Um, we know there was a fire. The whole building might not have been destroyed, but there was certainly enough rubble to make it worthwhile paying a mason, and we have the account, this is the priceless information we've got, paying a mason five shillings to retrieve 1,500 weight of lead from the ruin. Who owned the place? At that time, it had been just sequestered by Parliament uh, from John Powlett, the fifth Marquess of Winchester. This is the guy who owned Basing House by Basingstoke, which we dug, what, four or five years ago? Exactly, yes, a very interesting guy, a great siege, dramatic moment in history, and John Powlett was a very senior royalist figure and a focus for resistance to Parliament. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, look, there's the... Yeah. Uh, there's a new break. Oh, look, look, oh, look, look at that. Yeah. Full profile. I bet that bit goes on the top as well, does it? There you go, Mike. Does that go in? No. Oh, it's a spout, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a big pension. Look, big there, there, yeah, there's a spout, look. Yeah. That's the sort of thing you'd be expecting to see in the 16th, 17th century. Away from the excitement of the trenches, Henry's got the job of finding the complete circuit of the moat. Helpfully, there's already proof that it continued around here along the back of the now demolished north wing. You're standing right on the corner. Oh, right here? Right on the corner of the moat. Okay. Which went um, alongside, up against the building here. Oh, so where, where's that on the... Here, here's this on the photograph. The, this is the heating system built into the moat, and the okay. steps are down here. So where, whereabouts are we stood now? You're stood, stood about here. Oh, so, so we're you're, right, you're right, right on, on the, the moat? Of, you're right on the edge of the moat. Okay. Yes. So we're not doing badly. We've got a 15th century living quarters here and another 15th century building which we're digging the foundations of here. And now we know that the moat extended at least this far around it. Because our mystery building's two storeys high, the thinking is that it's not the Great Hall. Jonathan reckons that's most likely where Phil's digging on this side of the lawn. 
But so far, all Phil's discovered is masses of Civil War period pottery. It's all the sort of stuff you'd expect to find in the kitchen. There's none of your posh tableware here, it's all big mixing bowls. But we're getting things like glazed roof tiles, so, you know, nice posh roof. Bonus, we've got 16th or 17th century goblet. That is pretty, yeah, isn't it? It's Beautiful amazing, decoration it? around there, possibly yeah. Venetian. I don't know enough, uh, enough about these things to be certain, but that's a posh piece of glassware. That's not the sort of thing a peasant would have been drinking out of, I'll tell you. But the stuff we're really after is turning up in our trenches in the schoolyard. Oh, Ooh. look at that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that is lovely. It's a base. Yeah, <laughs> it's medieval. Um, it's this flinty stuff. The key to the early pottery around here seems to be flint and lots of it. Right. And this has got flint and lots of it. Right, what do we have to do, Neil? Right, just... Yeah. It's the first medieval pottery we've found, the first evidence of life here before the 15th century. And graphics have come up with a neat way to show the kids what it looked like. And then... I suppose expre that, uh, expression's good, isn't yeah, it? Like, no, no, feel the weight. Feel the weight, isn't it? That's it. Feel it. It's really heavy. Yeah. Is it out of the way, Neil? Oh, feel that but, weight in your muscles. Don't drop it. Oh, <laughs> what is it that they're carrying that is so agonisingly it. heavy? It's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 12th, 13th century cooking pot. It's based on a bit we found outside. Probably got sort of thing that would have been put on the fire. It even had bits of soot on the outside of it. Yeah. One, two, three, go! <laughs> Whoops. Out on the lawn, Matt's now opened up a second trench with some promising early results. I've got your wall, Jonathan. Good man, that is, that's, that's very definite, isn't it? Yep, quite a nice, or a very strong edge across there. It's pretty sturdy. <laughs> Tell you what I was looking for, Matt. Along there is the corner of that 15th century block. Yeah. Now, we don't know how far it extended this way. I was hoping that some way that you'd find some way of picking up the footings as they run we, down here. We, we have got a, the start of a cut going across there, but I mean, it might be a robbed out wall or something like that. So there's something there. Well, it might be, but you've got is. a wall, but it's, a, it's the wrong one. <laughs> it's the right one, it's just in the wrong place. <laughs> Matt's wall is also very different to the one Phil's now unearthed in his trench. They're obviously not the same building. We're going to have to extend both trenches to see more of them. But it hasn't been a bad start, and I want to use a bit of graphics magic to show Mandy what we have sorted out. Here is the house as it is now, and if you do away with the 19th century extension over there, and in addition to that, another 19th century thing, if we get rid of this porchway just there, mm -hmm. it's gone, uh, and then there's this 17th century top bit, just lose all of that. And then we've got two 16th century things here and here. Off they go. And then, apart from fiddling around with a few of these windows, what we've got left is the part of the building which is here now, which was here in the 15th century. That's fantastic. Not bad for one day, is it? No, not at all. It's amazing. So the first job is to extend Matt's trench to see more of the big wall, and also to join it up with Phil's trench, which hopefully will reveal another four foot wide wall to locate our great hall. You can see the date. We've got the pieces of paper with the date of it all on. Yeah. All the pottery has been put into a timeline for the kids, and the bulk of it comes from the 17th century, when it looks like many of the buildings were demolished after having been damaged in the Civil War. Tom, any ideas why you think there may be only a few pieces of pottery here? JJ, possibly? Mm, they haven't dug deep enough. <laughs> possibly, they might not have dug deep enough. Anybody know what that is? Uh, it's it's pipe. Yeah, that's right. Some of the tobacco pipes date to the 1640s, precisely the time of the Civil War, and the kids are fascinated by them. And joining up the trenches is revealing more finds by the minute. Can you still see the clapper in it's there? Intact. It's an animal bell. You see them in paintings by people like Bruegel. But this one's got decoration on it that it's looks like Look it's at this. yeah, possibly a Jacobean, Elizabethan Jacobean, oh, typical nice. kind of thing you see on wood carving as well. And there's a tiny shield. Do you see that there? So yeah, it's possibly yeah, a little yeah. stamp of the person that the animal that belongs the to, possibly for a horse or something. Perfect condition. Okay, there's another lump just here. No, yeah. 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 There. Now, is that arrow above the blip? Yeah. 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 So that tells you that that blip on the screen is where the wall is. So you could actually put the cane in like we've done. 
and mark the position of the wall. Although geophys are detecting walls belonging to many different phases of building at Hook Court, our basic aim is to work out the layout of the manor house, which may not have radically changed over the centuries. We know in the 15th century that there were posh living quarters here and another as yet unidentified medieval building here with the moat going around it. Yesterday, we opened up several small trenches in the school playground to find out more about that mystery building, and one of them has paid off. This small trench has revealed the remains of a spiral staircase, although it's difficult to see, as only the base of it's left. Can you Point see the curving face of the stones <laughs> running around very that slight way? Curve, yeah. Very, very slight. You're actually looking at the outer casing of a spiral staircase. So we now know that there was a spiral staircase linking the two medieval ranges. We've got the first one here, which is uh, this stone bit there, and then across here, and another bit here. It's like a sort of little compressed H shape. That's the earliest. Then we've got this wall here, a little bit of it by where Phil is, and then that long bit there. Cutting through it, we've got this thing here, which is really odd because it's curved. And actually, we've got a, a fourth phase too, haven't we? Because we've got this early stuff at the bottom. That's right. That stuff there could actually be earlier than our stones. That could be a timber phase, uh, 12th century. And it's all covered in material from the 17th century, when it's clear these buildings were demolished. Bridges Trench, in fact, may be turning up the first evidence of the Civil War fire. But what we're really after is finds like this. This is a very posh medieval floor tile. Now, I don't... Can I hold it? Yeah, of course. Now, I don't know if you can see, there's like a pattern impressed yeah, in yeah, it as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got certain curved lines yeah. here, straight lines. It's yeah, well, I've kind of taken the rubbing of it with a pencil, just to give you an idea of what was going on. I don't know if you can make so this out. so intricate, isn't it? You've got the geometric pattern coming around the outside and then this sort of bit of knot work in the middle. If this isn't from a great old road chapel, I'll eat Phil's hat. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> cool. This decorated tile dates to around 1500, part of a design that, when complete, would have looked something like this. What's just dawned on me is that our manor house probably included buildings both old and new. This is a coxcomb tile that would have adorned a roof built in the 14th century. Because typically the great hall is situated opposite the entrance, so it should be in the middle of the lawn, more or less where Bridge has opened up her trench. Given this news, Bridge in fact is wondering if she may have found the great hall. She's got bits of decorative stone from a medieval window. And this stone slab that would have supported a large post. That could be the crown jewel of the entire dig, if it's in situ. Now the most recent discovery, that there's a wall coming through here, has got our expert thinking. So after a few calculations... If we're talking about 16-foot units, which is your regular medieval pole yes. that a mason might use to set out a building, and occurs time and again, what you've got from that stone to this wall is about eight feet. Eight feet. A bit of measuring. That's 32. And the realisation that we have another wall coming through. I didn't know you even had a wall here. Well, I didn't realise that Joe had already started cleaning it until I Joe, just walked up here. Joe, your achievements are very <laughs> understated. Jonathan's now thinking we may have found our great hall, although its position seems different from what we expected. For the last two days, we've been looking for a great hall, and we thought we'd got one in Phil's trench, going all the way down here. Pretty long this is. There was a big pad here for a big column to support the roof there, going right down to there. But just in the last few minutes, our ideas have completely changed. Why, Jonathan? Because I was looking for the logical solution of a hall going in that direction, but Bridget has turned me 90 degrees and persuaded me that it might be to do with practical expediency of an old hall sitting on firm on this site while the rest of the manor develops around it. With a wall there and a wall there. You've turned Jonathan 90 degrees. This is your theory, right? <laughs> and you're absolutely convinced that this theory is right? I'm determined that this theory is right. Beginning of day three here at Hook Court School, where we're looking for a medieval manor house. 
uh, and the kids have been keeping diaries about the dig. This is from day two, Seema wrote this. Today it was really cool because the six of us went to wash the pottery. We also saw a cow's jaw, which was interesting and disgusting at the same time. And this one from Connie. They film me saying they hope to find a forgotten medieval manor house. I found it quite hard because there was a big fluffy thing in my face. That's your fault, Steve. But the big news for us on day two was that right at the end of the day, we thought we'd found one of the major buildings stretching from here right over to here, except that Geofiz disagreed. John, everyone was so excited and you brought their dreams crashing to the ground. <laughs> what was the matter? Well, it's just the interpretation of the Great Hall being here. I think it's where Phil is, where all the action is. That's where all my strong signals are. I do have things coming out here on the geophysics. They are clear, but not as good as over there. Whether we solved the puzzle or not, the kids are simply amazed at how much history is buried under their school lawn. The roof tile, I think, is it? Is it? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. In these tiles, are sort of 14th, 15th century, but they're in the 17th century deposit, so it looks like the late medieval roof still standing at the time of the Civil War, and then a whole shooting match comes down, you know? Yeah. The school timetable's been amended to allow the kids to help as much as they can. Some of the older kids are having a go at advanced geophysics. Who knows, they might be able to spot something we missed. Well, maybe that there yeah. could be actual building, and that could be a wall inside mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, they helped to survey this area of the lawn, and today we're opening up a trench that they'll help to dig. It's targeted on one of the clearest anomalies on the geophys plot. Well, that's the circular feature yeah. on here, look. Oh, so wow. It's a very, very obvious feature. There's been a lot of debate about what it might be, but I think my money's on it being a dovecut. Using the magic of graphics, we're able to show the kids the scale of the medieval buildings. These two are walking through what would have been the entrance to Hook Court back in the mid-1400s. Anyone entering the site back then must have crossed a bridge because we now know that the moat came around in front of the gatehouse. But the big news today is that Stuart doesn't believe the moat ever completely surrounded the manor house. In fact, he doesn't even think this is a moat. Well, what do you understand by moat? Well. There's knights in armour outside <laughs> and they're trying to get into the house and they can't because there's this big defensive feature. Yeah, well, that's the problem I have when it comes to this. Everybody uses the term moat. I mean, I prefer to use the term, at the moment, a water-filled ditch. Strictly speaking, a moat is a defensive ditch, but Stuart thinks this is designed to impress people rather than keep them out. This was dug in, say, the late 14th century. People aren't really digging defensive moats in a way, because yeah. yeah. the nature of the buildings uh, are changing, the nature of uh, the society is changing, and you're starting to get people thinking about decoration and ornamentation and gardens even. We've been drilling holes into our water-filled ditch and discovered that it's much deeper here compared to where it bends around the site. What's now clear is that this arm of the ditch must have been an extension added in Victorian times because it doesn't exist on this tithe map drawn in 1840. Meanwhile, at the other end of our possible Great Hall, another intriguing find is about to emerge from the soil. It's not a bit of copper pipe, is it? A bit of war pipe or something. Ooh. E ah. Ooh. Yep. It's a tap. It's a tap. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> This is actually a very rare find. Mick reckons it could be as early as 15th century. I think this is the best find we've had on the site, don't you? It's the best find we've had for years, that is. <laughs> you really think it's that important? Yeah, I think it's very important, yeah. We're so used to them, we forget that until the 19th century, they're very, very rare. You yeah. Know? yeah. This tap is likely to have been used with a cistern like this. It means there was running water here, and our manor house is even posher than we thought. But now it's late afternoon and time to start wrapping up some of our trenches. We have to go with our experts' conclusion that this two-storey building was a first-floor great hall, giving us a manor house that looks something like this. Our reconstruction shows Hook Court in the 15th century, the period when we know most about it. But we think this is pretty much how the manor house would have looked at the time it was set on fire during the Civil War. 
Soon after, all these medieval buildings were demolished, leaving only the posh lodgings and the gatehouse building standing. Well, you want us to find out about the history of Hook mm -hmm. Court. We may not have done the entire history, but we have done the entire owners of Hook Court in chronological order. Fantastic! <laughs> the genealogy <laughs> of your school. <laughs> Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. This is Wiccan in Northamptonshire, which may look to you or me like a typical English village. Over here you've got the posh manor house, you've got the church next to it. But 800 years ago there were two churches and two manor houses, in fact two villages, separated by this little stream. Right here where we are now was Wick Deve, and over here to the south was Wick Hammond. Naturally, the current residents of Wiccan are keen to find out why there were two villages here in the Middle Ages, and they also want to know what happened to the church and the other bits and pieces of Wick Hammond that have long since gone. They also want to know which was here first. But understandably, they're very keen to establish who's got the oldest bit of the village in their back garden. Time Team have been invited here to investigate the origins of two English villages, and as usual, we've got just three days to dig up the answers. John's talking to the farmer, who reckons he can narrow down the search. This is a very light field, this, particularly this end of the field. Yeah. But there's a patch, you can see a ridge just across here well, where the, the crop is tall, a little bit yeah. higher. And when we work the field, there is masses of stone there. Big stone, like that. OK, well, I'll arrange for the machine to come in and we'll take as small an area as possible. Yes, that's accepted. That's what we've agreed. So the business of clearing the crop gets underway in Wick Hammond. Basically, all we need to do is flatten the wheat so that Geophys can get in to do their survey. Over at Wick Deve, we're opening up a second trench and turning up a lot of 13th century pottery. Oh, yeah. Clearly, there were people living here in medieval times. Here you go. I think that looks a bit oh, better. Yeah. That's the stuff. There's some big old pieces. Too. Yeah, oh yeah. And where's this coming from? Pottersbury, just up the road. It's called Pottersbury because it was full of potters. There's been a, <laughs> in the medieval times, there's been about 20 kilns excavated there, and it's only a little village, but it's stuffed full of pottery kilns. Back at Wick Hammond, geophys are ready to reveal the first ever picture of this village's long lost church. I mean, it's not a clear footprint of a church. Oh, yeah. But I mean, there's definitely a building here. And it looks to uh, me as if there's lots of rubble over there. Yes. Well, it looks to me as if you might have the sort of chancel coming out here and the rest of it back there. So, yeah, if you can drop us on that. The earliest documentary reference for this church is in 1218, but we've no clue to when it was actually built. Hopefully, this trench will tell us that, and most importantly, if it was built on the site of an earlier Saxon church. Mick's keen to widen our search for Saxon material in the village and he's gone off to see if he can get permission to dig test pits in a few back gardens. That's right, it must be this one. Mm. I'll better ask the boss. Uh, <laughs> go on then. Can you show, on, us, sure. show us your garden and we can have a look okay. at it? Thanks. You know the idea, we just dig a one by one metre pit to see what yep. sort of pottery and stuff no you've got. Yep. And, uh, you know, that'll tell us a lot about the way the village has developed. I mean, do you mind us disturbing your grass? We'll be as careful as we can. That's OK, anything. Anywhere. I mean, if you take this family have already collected a few finds and stored them near the stream that was once the boundary between the two villages. Yeah, the stream's virtually dried up, hasn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, in the winter, that'll actually flow over that pipe or about six or seven inches. So. Really? Yeah. yeah. So Crikey. this is our stream, isn't it, Mick? That's yeah, but you can't yeah. believe it. It's all dried up right the way yeah. through, you know. Yeah. These are the stones. Oh, yes, and that, the, the right. Pottery is on, and pottery over small bits of but I mean, that looks like building stone. Yeah. Good. So that, yeah, so that's very good news. That yeah. suggests you might have had a building or a house on the site originally. Yeah. Well, so, that so. was under there used to be a garage there, and yeah. that was uh, under the base. My yeah. wife dug all that out by hand. Meanwhile, over here in Wick Hammond, I'm trying to get permission for more test pits, and the garden of this house seems to be perfect. Oh, nice oh, house! <laughs> what a beautiful pool, Tony! Oh. Look at that! <laughs> You're lucky in this weather. Wow. It goes on for miles. It just keeps on going, even in that direction. 
On and on and on. Well, um, I think we're going to need to consult about where best to put it. But you wouldn't mind, provided we don't do it over there, that we put something in. It would only be little. Yeah, that's fine. Anywhere. This garden is especially interesting because it's got a curved boundary round it and it's just next to our church site in Wick Hammond. We're approaching the end of the day now, but I'm keen to see how we're getting on unearthing a church that was last seen way back in 1619. Raksha, you've got something. Yeah, we're starting to see something eventually. We have these rather substantial stones here and then if you look at these two, they're faced off, so... So could that be the outside wall of the church? It'd be part of it, certainly. Not all of it, but part of it. What do you mean, part of it? It's wider than that. Beginning of day two here at Wickham in Northamptonshire, where we're looking for the origins of the village. Actually, it's a bit more complicated than that, because in the Middle Ages it was split into two villages. You had Wick Dive here, where we are now, and then a little stream, and then Wick Hammon over here. So far here in Wick Dive, we've had some Anglo-Saxon pottery out of that field and some mysterious earthworks, but as yet no structures, so we're going to keep on digging here. But the most exciting part of the day for me is that we're adopting a test pit strategy, which means we're going to dig lots of little holes all over the village. And in order to do that, we've recruited an army of volunteers who Mick and Richard are now briefing. We're putting in test pits in both Wick Dive and Wick Hammond. Don't assume, because it doesn't look interesting, that it is, isn't. You know, if any doubts at all, keep it. The worry is that they might not recognise Saxon pottery. It basically looks like dog biscuits, yeah. <laughs> but terribly important. You know. The test pits will only be one metre square, but they'll help to build up a picture of where people were living in medieval and Saxon times. Our test pits are going in on gardens coloured green on this map. But I'm wondering if we really need any more, because all these red dots record test pits already dug by Cardiff University. But I mean, you always do need more, because the finer the number that you've got, the more you can see the variations in different parts of the village. This is the area that I found so frustrating last night. Well, why did you find that frustrating? Well, because we've got loads and loads of finds from it and absolutely no Anglo-Saxon structures. If you'd have stayed around a bit longer and not skived off as you did, you would have actually been aware that we actually found post holes last night. Really? In that trench, there are post holes. Vents. <laughs> so if we can bottom out the footings, maybe we'll find phasing there. One of Raksha's main jobs now will be to dig down alongside the outer wall to see if it's been built on the foundations of an earlier church. Meanwhile, over at Wick Dive, Matt's got some good news about one of our new trenches. We've got a ditch. You can see the edge of it coming along here. Um, we've just got to the bottom of it here. It's about 20 centimetres deep. So we've got one side there. Unfortunately, the other side is just beyond the section here, so I think I'll have to extend it a little bit just to get the full width of it. Even better, we've got some pottery to date it. Isn't that fantastic? It's 10th century. It's exactly what we're looking for. It's, um, it's near to where it's the classic late Saxon pottery in this part of the world. But it's early days yet. We don't know if it is a ditch until we extend the trench to find the other edge of it. But we do have our first really good evidence of people living around here in Saxon times. Which way around does this go? It's the rim's in turn, so it's kind of like that. And how deep is it? Oh, maybe three inches at the most. Oh, quite, quite small. Yeah. And, and how wide? Uh, in a bit, in a bit. Yeah, about that probably. So sort of shepherd's pie size. Oh yeah, they're quite small. You do sometimes get them with um, sockets in the side that you could put wooden handles in and use them as frying pans. Helen, what are you doing here? I thought you were supposed to be over at Wick D. But it's Raksha's end of the trench that's got everybody excited. Why? What have we got, Raksha? Well, I decided to extend the trench because we wanted to see whether we could find any earlier phases of the wall and as we were going down we seem to have found a burial. A burial? Yeah, you can see this soft material here which is the fill of the grave and this is quite hard and you can see the cut just going all the way around. We found some ribs popping up here, there's a bit of a clavicle which is this bone just here but the really interesting thing about it is that it's north-south aligned. And it's underneath that wall there? Yeah, it's underneath the wall. So it's earlier than the wall. When do we think the wall is? Well, we think that this church complex is about 13th century. So what's the big deal about it being north-south? 
Well, most medieval burials are supposed to be west-east. You have your head to the west and your body to the east. And that's, that's true for the vast majority of the medieval period. But the further you go back into the Anglo-Saxon period, life is not so simple. They, don't, they haven't quite made a decision about exactly how they should be burying each other. And sometimes you do get these anomalous, weird burials. And I think this might be one of them. The discovery of a burial actually under a wall is more than we could have hoped for. It should help to date the construction of the wall. And better still, it could be proof that we found evidence of a Saxon settlement here in Wickhamon as well. But typically, just as I start to get excited, I'm given the bad news from Wick Deeve. Not only has our ditch turned out to be a pit, but Matt's discovered medieval pottery in it, suggesting it was dug in the 12th century rather than in Saxon times. Where's these post holes you were so pleased with then? No. Phil's got news too. He's finished digging his post holes and they too are part of the medieval history of Wick Dive. This is actually a wall. Now, if you follow up through here, you can project it right the way through here. And when you get to here, it forms a right angle with these big earthworks of the manorial complex. These are walls likely to have been put in by the manor and connected with the later use of this field. All the evidence suggests that in the 13th century, this field contained numerous wooden houses fronting onto the road close to the manor house and church. Then it appears these houses were all cleared away when the Lord of Wickdeve extended the grounds around the manor sometime in the 15th century. As well as adding to the picture of medieval Wick Dive, we also want to work out the layout of medieval Wick Hammon. We've already managed to locate the exact position of the church, and we're learning all sorts of details about what it looked like. Oh, wow. Look at that. Isn't that an amazing decoration? That is fabulous. You can imagine there must have been four of them there, curving around the circle. It's quite fancy. No matter where it is, isn't it? I mean, that, we haven't found anything else like that in the trees. No, we haven't. That's amazing. So you've actually got some pigeonholes on the left-hand side there. We've got the remnants of two uh, uh, rows of, of pigeonholes with the little ledges where the birds could uh, yeah, land. Yeah. Mick, that's really substantial. It isn't is it? fantastic, isn't so it? So what does that yeah. tell us? Well, presumably we're near a manorial complex or something like that. I think we're in the manorial farm. Uh, right. Lords have a monopoly on the keeping of doves and the brewing of ale. Yeah. So we're very much close to the Lord yeah. here, I think. But do you think this is the manorial complex itself? Because I mean, I've been looking at the, the layout of the village and the boundaries around it. The dovecot is over here and the church is over here. They seem quite a long way apart for this to be within the manorial enclosure. After analysing all the maps, Stuart reckons this curving boundary is a clue that the manor house was situated here. This would make sense, as it would put the manor house and the church close together as they are in Wick Dive. It's possible that the dovecot and the brew house were kept separate as a kind of little industrial unit. This is the first time anyone's ever been able to picture the two manors of Wick Hammond and Wick Dive together. With the day almost over, there's just time to water the trenches and the archaeologists, while Mick and I check the progress in our test pits. How are you getting on with the test pits, mate? Yeah, pretty good. I've been round them all now, and most of them are producing medieval pottery. It's all pretty much Pottersbury ware, sort of 1250, 1300 onwards. There's a few bits of earlier stuff, maybe 12th century, but nothing before that. They're all ongoing. I mean, you know, some are deeper than others. Some are only about 20 centimetres deep, some are about 40 centimetres deep. I think you should knock off now. It's late, it's hot. We'll do the rest tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow, as they go deeper, they'll turn up some Saxon evidence. Helen's worry is that we might not have discovered an in situ burial under the wall of the church. So far, we've found no trace of a skull, and they could just be random bones. Digging graves is a slow process, but with less than a day to go, hopefully we'll get an answer soon. But there's a lot more to this trench than just old bones. We're discovering all sorts of details about the history of this church. Beautiful, isn't it? I mean, these piles are really small, and they're, they're actually smaller than some of those decorated piles that we've had, which suggests an earlier phase of floor. They are very small. I've never seen them small enough. 
Oh, sort of church environment. But it's not just in the trenches that we're uncovering the forgotten history of Wiccan. Stuart's been making some important discoveries of his own about the village green and the large garden belonging to the rectory. I sometimes get the feeling at the beginning of day three that we've been summoned yeah. by Stuart. <laughs> to be told what's going on. <laughs> Stuart spotted on an old map that these two areas were both covered in houses that have been cleared away since the map was drawn in 1717. And what they've done is just cleared all those properties away to create a large garden and they're diverting the stream to put ponds in there. It's a piece of ornamental landscape in their garden. It's just like when they used to build the stately homes. That's yeah. right, get rid of the peasants. Well, it's, it's, it's a mini one, isn't it? It's, it's, a, is. it's a mini, mini park, really, That's right. is what they're doing. Yeah. Well, the thing the biggest surprise, the though, is that Stuart reckons this stream wasn't the boundary between the two villages in medieval times. In fact, the layout of the village is actually quite regular over here, and I think the road is more likely to be part of the structure and division between the, the two, two villages. You caught us at the most exciting moment. We oh. think we've found And the other thing that's really exciting is we've just extended the trench. Out of the machining came a piece of pottery. Paul has dated that to maxi wear, 650 to 750. Oh, that's fantastic. That's the early stuff we've got then. I know it is beginning to raise the possibility that there, there is activity, including burials, on this site right from the Middle Saxon period. Point of clarification, are you the same archaeologist who was so miserable around <laughs> the of the man earlier on? Fantastic. We have got an in-situ burial, and it could be 1,300 years old, although it has been disturbed by later building on this site. We've got this grave cut here. The skull would have been just under the wall here, mm. but as you can see, because they were building the wall, they've messed around with it, and the skull has actually travelled down here. None of the bones are articulated. They're, they're just a jumbled mess, and here we have some of the teeth. That's hardly worn at all. That's no. like a juvenile or a young adult, yeah. isn't it? This bit comes from a pot that would have looked something like this. And surely it's an encouraging sign that there was something going on here in Saxon times. We've only got a few hours left to find out, so it's just as well that we're starting to make sense of the medieval church. We wanted to find the junction between the nave, where the congregation stood, and the chancel, where the altar was, and it looks like we've found it. Usually the tower's added later in the sequence, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So by the time we put the tower on, I think that would have side aisles. And this is how we think it looked before it was pulled down in the 17th century. Although the focus is now very much on the church here in Wickhamon, there's still the job of sorting out all the information gleaned from our various test pits. Essentially, what we've been doing is adding lots of new information to the archaeological map such as the lost road and buildings discovered here in the rectory gardens. Well, nearly everything from this test pit's medieval. It's the uh, Pottersbury again, uh, mid-13th to 14th. We didn't find any trace of Saxon history in these back gardens, but the medieval pottery finds add to the picture of how the village of Wickdeve expanded around 1200 AD. Yeah, I mean, it all seems to be from the pottery the same day along this entire block. I mean, I can't imagine that these things just you know, sprung up simultaneously by accident, certainly. Right. So. It strikes me that we might have a bit of village planning going on here in Wickdeve. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. This is the village of Nether Poppleton, just outside York. As you can see, most of the houses are modern, some are Victorian, a few are 18th or at a push 17th century. But from up here, it looks very different. Even I can recognise a traditional medieval village layout, with the main street running up to the church and lots of little plots running off it. And those earthworks to the side of the church are an officially registered medieval site. But the locals think it's older. They think they can trace the roots of their village back to the Normans or even the Saxons. Are they right? We've got just three days to find out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you know what you're supposed to do next? <laughs> <laughs> About a third of them. Well done, Mick. <laughs>
We want you all to get back to your homes with your pet archaeologist in your hand <laughs> and start digging, all right? <laughs> Off you go! <laughs> <laughs> As they all set off, there's a great sense of community spirit about. Many people are digging in their own gardens, or they'll help out their less able neighbours. They'll bring all their finds to the incident room. We'll analyse and date them, and when we've identified the oldest, we'll decide where to put trenches in tomorrow. We've divided the village into five sections, each one with its own archaeologist, to make sure that things are done properly. Across the village, test pits are opening all over the place. And everyone's doing their part. When you dig a trench, if it's a metre at the top, it must be a metre at the bottom. In other words, the sides of the trench must always be absolutely vertical. This means that the, the layer that you've got exposed actually on the bottom of the trench, you can actually see it in section. So don't just dig in the middle of the hole, dig right up to the edges, keep them straight. There's, there's Phil's gospel lesson for the day. <laughs> By mid-morning, we're well on our way to exploring this side of the village where the main street and houses are. But over here to the east lies the church. It was built in Norman times, so it's possible there was something else there at that time. The church is usually a central feature of the community, so if we're going to understand how people have lived here, we need to look at the church. Is that one Norman? I think Norman in its present form, but there must be earlier and later stuff as well. Do we know much about the actual history of this site, Sarah? Well, the church is dedicated to St Everilda, who's a very unusual dedication. There are only two churches dedicated to her in Yorkshire. She was a 7th century saint. We think that Bishop Wilfred, who was Bishop of York, encouraged her to settle in Yorkshire with two other nuns in the 670s, and around them a community at set of up to 80 nuns soon formed. Back in the village, people are beginning to get the hang of things. Nope, nothing in that one. And oh, well. some finds are coming up. You see a tad, a bit of green glaze over there? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's almost as old as I am. Another stone in two. I think you've got a Roman brick. <laughs> you've got a good imagination. Very vivid. Yes. yes. <laughs> Very vivid. The early signs, at least in this trench, well, look good. That's what I'd call proper medieval. You're like 13th, 14th century. Um, jug sheds, it's local stuff probably made somewhere around York. These haven't travelled far at all, so, I mean, I think you could well be on top of some medieval archaeology here. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd never believe, would you, that... No, I'd have never believed this was here at all. I see you've got a pipe there, Phil. Anything else? Yeah. You see here, Tony, got a little child burial. Oh. Just one of those things, really. I mean, you know it's a burial ground. What are you going to do with it? Um, we're going to give it the, the due respect it deserves and, and just leave it alone. Funnily enough, it doesn't actually detract from, from the objectives of what we're of the trench here. Which is? Well, you see, if I get my shovel, you see, if I slot it in there, yeah. now, that is the base of the foundations. So, the whole church is sitting on big stones like this. The main thing is that there is nothing, no walls coming this way. So, in fact, we know that there was no... It doesn't look as though there are any oils or transepts coming this way off of that wall. Because we thought there might. You see that curve yeah, there, Tony? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks as if there's a, an opening in there, and we thought that something might come off here. Well, so you think it doesn't. might just be a door? I think it might be more like a sort of tomb set in the wall oh, or I an see. Easter sepulchre or something. Clearly, it's not a structure yeah. coming out this way. So it's answered that. So now you've answered that, do you have to continue with this trench? Or can yeah. you... No, no, because we know that it was not wider. Yeah. What we've now got to prove is whether or not it was longer. So that's, this so way. that's when that you wrap it around, around, yeah. you wrap it around yeah. the corner. Across the village, even more test pits are opening up. There are now 32 of them. 
Three o'clock day one, and this whole area is checkered with test pits. There's one down there by that yellow bucket, then two gardens along, there's one over there, then another three gardens along by that guy in the red hat, there's one, and then way, way at the end of that same garden by that blue tarpaulin is another one. Well, this worked. Now Paul and Carenza are complaining they've got too much to do. Um, you could just put them down there somewhere. 9am and there's frantic activity in the incident room. Outside, the locals are gathering to find out what we can tell from the test pits yesterday. Inside, we're still trying to work it out. We've got no Saxon pottery at all from this end of the village. And it's not until we start heading west through the village that we get a few fragments of Saxon pottery, tiny triangle here showing just a few grams of pottery, tiny little amount there, a bit more here as we head west, and then even further west in this completely different bit of the village, what looks like a different history. Well, I think we've got to build on what we did yesterday, take this test pitting strategy and apply it to this area. We've got to look at the, around the old stables, the granary, you know, the space at the back of the incident. Room. Let's get some trenches in there, you know, get some more local people involved in digging those, take it forward. So up by the church, we open a test pit here. And here. And another here. And John does some more geophysics in and around the church to see if we can find other targets. Mick's getting more and more excited. It's not just Saxon he wants, he thinks that there was a monastery here. That would mean a settlement 400 years earlier than the present church. Could he be right? Mick, you've closed down this trench. Yeah, well, it's told us all we needed to know, which is that the church doesn't go on further east. But that means we've still got this 400-year-old gap between the time the nun died here and the time they put up this church in memory of it. Yes, but I think looking at it as a gap is probably wrong. I mean, we're, we're pretty sure of what would have happened during that period. Well, what do you think happened? Well, what tends to happen is when you get somebody who, who's turned into a saint, you, you often have a monastic community with it. And that is unlikely to have survived more than a couple of hundred years because the, the Scandinavians coming through here. Well, the old Vikings? Yeah, the Vikings. And they burn everything down, they destroy everything. If there's ever a nun in here, it just evaporates. Stuart's survey of the earthworks around the church has thrown up some interesting results. Here's the church. There's a medieval moated site just here. But there's also a whole other system of earthworks. This seems to be a roadway from the river heading straight towards the church. There also seems to be a large platform at the top of it, and off to the side is a large lump in the ground, another platform. It looks like it could be a boundary ditch of some sort, so we put a trench just here to see if it is. What's nice here is we can see two distinct phases of archaeology. We've got the later wall, which looks to be 18th century handmade bricks running down the garden, and they're overlying straight on top of this earlier cobbled surface, which contains 15th century and therefore probably dates to that point too. It's marvellous to see this. I've laid some of the finds from the test bits out, sort of in chronological order, uh, give you an idea of what's going on. We've got the Romans down there all on their own. Um, then a great big gap here. This, this is, is the black hole of 400 years. Yeah, this is the, the early and middle Saxon, say 450 to 850 AD. There's nothing so far. And then we arrive at the late Saxon. Now, when we're saying late Saxon, I suppose what we really mean is Viking age, 850 through into the 10th century. Then we've got this stuff, which is all the Norman period stuff, 11th to 12th century. So those people who were saying that this is a, a medieval settlement, we've, we've proved that that's wrong. We've got a lot of Norman Oh, stuff. yeah, we've got Norman and we've got pre-Norman, so... I think from the pottery we've got here, there's very little doubt that there's, uh, there was a settlement here in the Norman times. The pottery we found proves that there were people living in and around Nether Poppleton right through the medieval period and right back to the 11th century. That part of the village occupied by houses was laid out in the medieval period, but there was already a Norman community living here. So we closed down all the test pits in the village. They've answered that question. Out in Phil's trench, he's now reached the bottom of this feature. 
The Saxon pottery he found came from the other side of the trench. But what does this side tell us? So what do you reckon? What have we got out of this now? <laughs> well, not quite what we expected, Mick. Right. You remember on the geophysics, there was that, that white line, which Very we clear, thought was, was, was going to yeah. be a, a beam slot, a yeah. building, that sort yeah. of thing. Well, there's no way that this is a building. This is a massive ditch. It's going to come out, what, at least that size? Well, I was going to say, because you've only got one half, haven't you? The other half going to be That's over right. here somewhere. And have you got any dating for that ditch? Yep, we've had pottery from about the Norman Conquest, right through to about the 14th century. It's, it's within those sort of three or 400 yeah, years. Yeah. And, and I think that what we're looking at is activity here in the early medieval period at the same period as that church starts to be built. So yeah. what do you think we have got here? I think it's probably something to do with, well, the Norman period, you know, the, the church is all of that sort of date and later. Yeah. We'd expect some sort of manor house to go with it probably somewhere in this area, if not down on the, the moated mound. And this is one of the land divisions associated with that. The main thing is, I think, that we've actually got people living round here, yeah. which, of course, you don't have now. Up on the top of the hill here. If you look at it now, yeah. there's just one house here. Yeah. There's no, no village at all. Yeah. In those days, this would have been thriving. But what of Mick's missing monastery here at the east end of the village around the church? Do we have any evidence for that? Well, we do. Why they've used it as fish ponds is because it's, it's an old river channel coming through there. The Saxon ditch we found is most likely, in this instance, to have been from a monastic settlement. The church seems to have been built on the site of a former church or monastery. Its dedication to a saint who died 400 years earlier is an important clue. And the topography on a promontory is similar to that of many other monastic sites. So now we just have to explain all of this to the people of Poppleton. What can we tell them after three days of exploring? Mick, can I borrow you a minute? So we've got Anglo-Saxon here, Anglo-Saxon here. Yeah, we must have some sort of hamlet here. Well, to begin with, they were right. Their village is older than it looks. This pottery shows us that there was occupation here in Norman times, and in Saxon times. In the Saxon period, there was an enormous enclosure surrounding a monastic settlement. It would have had a church as the centrepiece, houses and a few workshops. The promontory it's situated on is perfect. Easy access to York and a bit of height to give it some security. In Norman times, the present church was built and a settlement grew up around it. The good news is that because of what we've discovered, you're going to be really busy for years to come. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses plus lots more.